name is Rob Gatra. I am an artist, an activist, a designer, an engineer, and a fabricator uh, working in the Bay. Um, it's expensive there, so you have to have a lot of jobs. Um, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, um, I use he, him, his pronouns. Uh, in this talk, I'm gonna talk about my past work, um, my current project, uh, and uh, then we're gonna have like a discussion and it'd be pretty casual, you know, anytime something comes up, uh, feel free to raise your hand. Come on, I was working before. These aren't that good yet. It's sort of light. Yeah. So, thanks for coming. Um, there are a few specific terms that I'm going to use in this talk. Uh, some of them, uh, I guess one question is, how many people have been to Maker Bay before? Cool. Um, and. How many people heard about this through TGR or a similar organization? <laughs> but just get an idea of like how much technical stuff versus how much gender stuff, like mm. what, what to explain and what will make everybody bored. Um, the uh, I am a cisgendered white American male. I think that's really important for me to get out of the way because I'm making a project uh, that severely affects uh, the lives of transgender and conforming people, and I'm currently giving that talk in Hong Kong, uh, where I know almost nothing about the trans, queer, and gender non conforming communities, and almost nothing about the you know, restroom culture, or restroom situations, or the culture and consequences surrounding vandalism, which is something this project touches on. Um, cisgendered is an adjective that generally just means uh, not trans. Um, it's a you know, cisgendered person is a person whose gender identity and gender expression uh, matches the sex they're assigned um, at birth. Um, and the, the, I use the term, term general uh, gender to generally refer to um, the social expectations uh, that are uh, culturally imposed upon us. Um, and the talk says they talk about sex, but that's kind of more about the physiological uh, dimorphic component of you know, our bodies. <laughs> um, cool. I'm gonna show you eight examples of my past work, um, much of which is less political, but just to give you an idea of the kind of things that I've made and maybe some sense of why I made them. Why don't I let you open the Google slides? I'm just not gonna pre for all the videos. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, it's lovely. So this was the first thing I made it that uh, I realized was sculpture and that made me think that maybe like art is the thing I was interested in. This is the pencil machine. It uses polymer clay uh, extruded around uh, like a thick mechanical pencil lead to, in a semi-automated fashion, um, it's all hand cranks, uh, make pencils. You know, it just stamped a logo onto the pencil and then it goes into a toaster, which I just took the bottom off and then it bakes the clay so it becomes hard, and then you stamp or eraser out of a bigger eraser, and then you attach it to aluminum tape, and you can sharpen it and write with the pencils. They're incredibly fragile, uh, but they're cute and, uh, <laughs> and stupid. And I was like, wow, I spent weeks on this. I mean, it's like, it's not motion, it's art. <laughs> yeah, it's like, a, I don't know, it's, it's, it, it's like, it's evocative about manufacturing, or maybe it's, you know, about the ubiquity of these intricate and difficult to make things, or, I don't know. At the time, I didn't have much of a statement, but at the time, I was majoring in industrial design, uh, which is the design of consumer products. You know, like uh, one of, for a real assignment they gave us is over the weekend draw one thousand toasters, and I was just like, wait, what? Like, <laughs> we're fine on toasters. Like, you can go to the store and there's seventy brands of toasters, all of which toast bread and will last for several years. Like, how am I gonna? Like, how can I even design three toasters that have significant conceptual or aesthetic differences? And the other students had no problems. They were like, I love drawing, I love form, I love consumer products. And I was just like, uh, I'm really bad at this, I have moral problems with this, drawing is hard, drawing a thousand toasters is impossible. Um, so I dropped out of, I mean, I took a break, I dropped whatever, and I, and I uh, moved to LA to study, or to take a fabrication internship, and I worked at this company, and we did like, uh, interactives for retail displays and props for commercials and, I don't know, like, just stupid things for marketing, like pushing a Mini Cooper off of a stack of shipping containers and, like, making intricate chain of reaction machines to, I don't know, sell, sell something. Uh, and I learned a ton about 
making, but more importantly, I learned that it's possible to make a living by working with your hands, um, even in like large American cities, as long as the things you're making are intricate enough to, I guess, warrant uh, getting paid more than minimum wage. Uh, and then at the culmination of that year, um, hold on. Where's the mouse? Okay. Oh no, that's worse. Okay, well, you can still see things. It's just I look a little ghastly. This is crazy. So this is a rock that connects to the internet and fetches the weather forecast. And then it heats itself up or cools itself down to the temperature of the forecast. So instead of saying, like being like, oh, like should I put on my shoes, it's gonna be 30 tomorrow, I should put on my short shorts, or like it's gonna be a five tomorrow, like I should put on my coat, you just touch the rock and you get frostbite or you burn your hand. And uh, like Jenny is doing here. Uh, this is my first and only previous Kickstarter campaign. And it failed. Uh, it failed for a lot of reasons. Uh, one of which is that I failed to control my costs, and the retail price was three hundred dollars, and I had to sell, I think, five thousand of them to hit the target. And very few people are willing to spend three hundred dollars on what is essentially uh, putting your hand out the window. <laughs> um, but I learned a lot about video editing, about metal metallurgy, I guess, about thermodynamics, um, and programming. This was a prettier version that never worked. This one also never worked, but the backers didn't know that. Um, <laughs> God, the contrast needs some help. Anyway, um, yeah, so I was like, okay, kind of tail between my legs. Uh, I'm not gonna be a gadget gadgeteer. In hindsight, I, I like to pretend that this project was like a performance art piece, making fun of the absurdity of the Internet of Things, which was just then becoming a thing. You know, like this idea that everything you own needs to be connected to the Internet, and that like these imaginary solutions are, or it's like a solution in search of a problem. Uh, and I like it better that way. Unfortunately, at the time, it's just not true. I was very earnest and serious about the project. Um, so I went to art school after that because, oops, come on. Uh, because it turns out if you have half of a BFA in design, uh, you either have to finish it, uh, start over, as in like go, go through another, another full four years of school, or major in something that's so much less serious than design that they'll accept your design credits as legitimate. So I majored in art, uh, which isn't that it's not serious, it's just they don't care. Um, because there's nobody at the end, of, when you graduate, who's gonna call them up and be like, I can't believe you issued an art degree to this person. They can't mix oil. Um, and there, I, uh, at Carnegie Mellon, I studied uh, I took some robotics classes, I took some engineering classes, and a lot of art classes. And my final project was this, uh, which is a robot that projects a fake moon at the moon all the time. Uh, <laughs> so you plug it on, you turn it on, and you, it finds a GPS location, it finds the current time, and then it looks up where the moon is supposed to be using uh, these tables. These You'd think it would be done with math, but it's actually done with these projection tables um, that were developed by like monks like hundreds of years ago, just for the moment because they're watching the moon. Um, so there's a laser etched uh, mirror that is shaped like the moon with this cup that rotates around it to do the phase. Um, and then I found that a garage, this roboticist in Pittsburgh had a garage sale and he had taken apart like an MRI machine and that's the motor that I used. It's made almost entirely out of academic trash, which is very good trash. Um, <laughs> And yeah, it worked. Like there, this during, uh, it's a simplification to say that during the daytime the moon's underneath our feet, because often it's above us during the day also. But when the moon is beneath your feet, it just projects it on the ground. Uh, kind of kind of as a reminder that we're in space. And at night, it, if it's outside, it's kind of this pathetic gesture where it's like overpowered by the moonbeams. But it's um, it's aesthetically interesting. Yeah. In this case, I had to carry a like huge battery with me to the park. Also, but that wasn't in the video. Did you keep this piece? I do. It's it's in three boxes. Um, it's in my parents' basement. Every year, they text me, ask me, ask me if I can. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no. I mean, yes, but no. Don't tell me if you do it now. <laughs> um, so out of undergrad, I got my uh, an art residency, 
at this place called Pier 9, uh, which is a workshop in San Francisco uh, that's Autodesk. Uh, Autodesk is a software company that had an art residency for several years. And uh, they just let you use their equipment and software to make essentially whatever you want uh, in exchange, and they get publicity out of it. That program has been shut down, um, but while I was there, I made these. Uh, you might be familiar with the C clamp. Uh, in British English, it's called a G clamp. Uh, it's you know a clamp that's shaped like a C, and it's you know there's probably several here. No, maybe I'm blinded by this light. We we used to have them, but we moved them to metallurgy in the other branch. All right. Yeah. Um, I kind of felt like it was unfair that there's all these letters and only the C gets a clamp, so I made a whole set of clamps. <laughs> Uh, if you ever want to make a set of these yourself, your first step is to buy 26 C clamps and then throw the C away, <laughs> because that's the cheapest place to get the totally parts. Um, the project I'm best known for, uh, not to say it's my best project, is this. Um, this was an intentional comment on productivity culture, instead of the cryoscope, which was an accidental one. Uh, hamster, or standing desks and treadmill desks were really popular, and my friend uh, at work, this is at Autodesk Pier 9, uh, said it would be cool if we had a standing, a standing, a hamster wheel standing desk. And I said that that's exactly the level of stupid I'm interested in, <laughs> and we built it together in about a day and a half. And uh, the real beauty of this project was, at some point, we, I posted online, I got a call from a Huffington Post writer. I'm going to try to do the voice because it's an important part. He says, dude, dude, I just found your hamster wheel standing desk, and i got to say, like, oh, my God. <laughs> like, you know, people, we used to be like cavemen, right? And we used to, like, walk and hunt and stuff. But now we're, like, sitting at desks, and that sucks. Like, this is better because it gets us, like, walking around more like our natural selves. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and he's like, also, you know, like, obesity, diabetes, and I'm like, deep vein thrombosis, restless leg syndrome, and he's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he asked me a few questions, and I'm like, I'm like all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to run it. I'm going to run the story. And I'm like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> like four hours later, he gets me a call, and he's like, rah, this is Brad. And I'm like, hey, Brad. And he's like, my editor just came out of my office, and he thinks this whole hamster wheel <laughs> desk thing is some kind of joke. <laughs> I'm like, what? There's nothing funny about deep vein thrombosis, <laughs> which, as I didn't say, I know nothing about, and it might be very serious. But, and he's like, that's what I said, we're running it. And they ran the story, and then everyone else ran the story. And then we got calls from talk shows. We got, me and Will got flown down to Los Angeles with the wheel <laughs> to appear on talk shows and to straight-facedly try to tell American audiences that we thought this was a good idea. <laughs> And the talk shows thought they were making fun of us, but in fact, both of us were making fun of the same person, which is Brad. <laughs> um, so in a lot of ways, it was my most successful project. Uh, Ellen mentioned in her show, Queen Latifa took us on, The Doctors, we were on NPR. It, it, it was everywhere. And uh, it was really dangerous and really dumb. Um, without the desk, uh, if you tried to slow down, your intuition is to stop with, by putting your foot forward. Which in this case means you put your foot uphill. Yeah, and then it'll keep turning. Which we, yeah, it makes it right. faster until you find yourself pinned to the wheel <laughs> doing a complete turn. <laughs> Has that actually happened? Yeah. Um, Cesar and my friend Bilal uh, got to the top and then fell face <laughs> No, No bones broken. No bones no. broken. Okay, uh, just a try. He's made a rubber. <laughs> uh, then I got a art. Residency. Oh, this is gonna look so bad on this projector. I'm so sorry. It's okay. Uh, it's nice rainbows. <laughs> oh, that's not so bad. It's only the really bright stuff that's messed up. Um, so, I got a residency at the San Francisco Dump. You know where you bring your trash. Uh, they have had a program for about 25 years where three artists at a time get access to the infinite pile of unwanted stuff and make art out of it. And uh, styrofoam, I think, is a really interesting material because it's like totally pristine and white in a way that like classic cooling materials just couldn't be unless they were marble. Uh, but it's also infinitely cheap and uh, probably the worst thing for the environment in the entire polymer family. And uh, it's recycled almost nowhere. Uh, and San Francisco doesn't recycle it either, but they separate it. 
And uh, so I made a big pile of styrofoam, and then I uh, found these, I still don't understand exactly what they are, but I know what they are, but I don't understand what they are. They're medical hologram backlights, and uh, a surgeon for the army died, and all of his possessions showed up at once in like a you know, 15 meter truck, and we all just pushed out. And among his possessions, I found these three boxes that, uh, as a side effect of their intended, I'm surely scientific operation, produced really nice rainbows. Um, and I just put them on loader. Um, and I don't know, it's just like a pensive and beautiful contemplation of like what we value and what is trash. Um, and then for the second to last project in the previous work, this project called Strange Lenses. Um, which is also in my hands. Uh, there are lenses that are designed uh, to have the same face messing with effects as like photo booth or uh, um, Snap Snapchat or Messenger. Um, and this was a public art installation to pass this around. Um, they work best if it's halfway between you and your friend. Um, <laughs> which was a huge communication design problem that I tried to solve with this tiny 3D print of two people. Um, but yeah, this was installed on the streets of San Francisco for about 13 months. Um, it got smashed and grabbed twice. Either somebody really liked it or really hated it. <laughs> really to clear rich. <laughs> uh, after it got smashed the second time, the city made me take it down. But it had a pretty good run. Um, the I learned a lot about a lot of things in this project. I thought that public art was like going to be the thing that really made me feel great and really did it. You know, like getting it out of museums and into the public where everybody can interact with it without like a paywall and all these cultural problems. Uh, but I found that when I wasn't actually there, like plausibly wearing artist clothes, standing close enough to it that people thought it was mine, nobody stops. Like if, if you can't convey that this was made by a person, um, people aren't interested. And since it was in the same uh, enclosure that like billboards come in, it really just felt like part of like the city and uh, a city that's very harsh and unwelcoming. So uh, these are my friends. I didn't pay them, but I might as well have. <laughs> uh, uh, like I was once spent two hours watching it on like a regular work day and one person stopped. And it, I don't know, it's, it's traffic is really, it's the busiest pedestrian thoroughfare in California, I think it has like, I think three million people walk by it a, a, a year. Um, and uh, my email address was on it, and no, not a single email. Just to give you an idea of, of, of the kind of engagement it got. Uh, so I was just, I was surprised. I was like, I thought that making a successful public art installation was as in easy as putting an interesting thing in public. Um, and I think it's a lot more complicated than that. Uh, it's looking for a home, if you know anybody, <laughs> with a crane that can lift 300 pounds, or 300 kilos, um, and um, and has some crap land. <laughs> I think the concept is actually really interesting. We're trying to engage strangers socially somehow and give them like a something to play with. Exactly. Yeah. yeah I, the the hope was that it had turned some strangers into friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, during the festival, when it was un un unleashed, unveiled. <laughs> uh, it was very successful at that. You know, people like you know uh, playing. Sorry, they played with. Yeah, it. people played. Like you know, like a lot of like you know chronically unhoused people interacted with like city officials, and like there were all these really unlikely, and like people. Um, oh, uh, one other side effect was it was lit at night um, with light that was you know like this kind of like warm nice light instead of yellow street lights. So uh, it, it had a secondary use as just like a place for you know unhoused people to hang out, which was great. I'm glad somebody had a use for it. But the city has so systematically took everything off of that street that offered any seating or any shelter in the 80s. So there are no horizontal surfaces and there are, there's nothing that can be sat upon uh, anywhere on that, in that corridor because the business owners control the government and think that homelessness is caused by chairs. 
uh, it's super upsetting. Like the my project was part of ten, was one of ten projects who got the same amount of money to put an art piece on the same street for the same amount of time, and uh, only mine made it to day four. Uh, day three, the business owners association went around with the clipboard and said, "This has an overhang. This could be sat on. Somebody could lay on this." And the next day, they were just gone. Um, super sad. Like you know, thousands of person hours, a huge amount of civil investment. All from like the planning department who was like well meaning and wanted the city to be for everybody and the business owners were like, You can't have something that involves homeless people outside of a Saint John or really the time. Um, yeah, I asked the bell hops, the people who take bags from the nearby hotel, to like call me if the glass got broken and both times the glass got broken nobody called. So it means that if something like if person A smashed the glass and person B took two lenses, person C would take five lenses, and by the time I got to it all my lenses are gone. And surely the person who broke it had no intention of stealing lenses. I think their intention was just like to make an impact on the environment. Or, I don't know. I think it's complicated. <laughs> so if you did it again, if, well, how would you, what would you think you could do to engage people more? That's a great question. Something I've thought about a little bit, but mostly in like, oh, I should have done this, and not so much of like, a, this would have been the way to solve the problem, is there's a concept um, in art called presence of hand which is something that I think is, some are, some really famous artists are really known for having none of this, like Jeff Koons or you know whatever, where they make these things that are impossible, where there's no way it could have been made. Where there's no evidence that a human ever touched it. There's no fingerprints, there's no welds, there are no joints, there are no, there's no hardware, it's just these immaculate uh, emergences of, of, of phenomena. And I think that it's, people really don't care about that stuff, um, <laughs> unless they're really fancy people. But if this were like made in a, if, if this were in a box that was clear that it was like made by a person, like you know, that had like, you know, handwriting, for example, or like a wacky font, if it was very clearly not a Pepsi ad, because if I were walking by this, I would try to give it as little attention as possible, because I didn't want to be duped into looking at an ad. But since it's in an ad box and it's on the street next to all these ads, why would I give it time of day? Maybe you have something to signify that it's like an interactive piece. Like, you know, when you said that when it was launched, a lot of people got together to, um, you know, share the piece, like, like play with it. Mm -hmm. So, like, something, maybe, like, a, a sign that says, like, you know, come interact with me or something like that. Yeah, I had, my science ended up as being, like, really sterile and corporate. And I, I blame kind of my industrial design background, which kind of kicks in at some, sometimes. Sometimes I don't want it to. You know, like with this, you know, very clean. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think this started moving in the breeze and threw me off. Um, yeah. They had like a trilingual sign, which I think was great, but it was very clean and very corporate. And the, I couldn't. The grant was only, and it sounds like a lot, but ten thousand dollars actually isn't enough to buy anything that can stand up to the street. So I had to convince Clear Channel, like a very large and very evil corporation, to donate me the box. So it was literally the same box the billboards were. Um, yeah, the first lenses were seen or were 3D printed out of clear resin and then polished for about 20 hours each. The second lenses were CNC'd out of plexiglass, out of acrylic, and then polished for about 12 hours each. And then eventually, I found out that this uh, clear silicone, which is going around, exists, and then you can cast. And then you just have to polish one, and then you then you can make beautiful fits. Um, the last part I just want to talk about is a lot more fun and less political. I mean, this isn't that political. Uh, I'm trying to make this a thing, but uh, it turns out that hair and nails made out of the same stuff, and uh, nail glue only comes off because like we use our hands a lot and our nails grow out, but if you use nail glue on your hair, you can permanently attach things like rhinestones. Um, so if you lay out the rhinestones in a pattern you like, you can pick, you can pick them all up at once with a piece of masking tape, and then put a drop of nail glue on each rhinestone once they're once they're flat side up, and then apply them all at once to your hair, and then you have semi-permanent rhinestones. In your hair. You can wash your hair, you can go swimming, um, and when you don't want them anymore, you just shave them out because you have to cut your hair anyway. It's inevitable. <laughs>
Ta-da. How long do you keep one um, group of them usually? That's a good question. I try to do like three weeks, but I'm not that good about it. These are five weeks. Uh, so you can see they used to be in a perfect like hex grid oh. or like a triangular grid. Uh, and now they're like, and soon they're going to start flipping around and that's not a good look because mm. the backside is wrong sense. <laughs> time to get a shave. It's time to get a shave. Uh, and I brought the kid if after this talk anybody wants. Yeah. Don't they fall off when you wash your hair? Uh, you would think so, but um, now that I am more strategic about it, I wash my hair with soap before I put them in, so there's like no oil, and then I mm -hmm. condition them after. But and I do like a quick alcohol dab to make sure there's no oil, and I use a better I use a better glue. Um, I usually lose. I mean, how many am I missing now? Like six and spend three weeks. So, so there are many we cannot. <laughs> yeah, there are many that aren't missing. <laughs> Any questions, comments? I have a question. So uh, you you expressed the reaction of people to your work, but you mentioned that there are some work that are more important to you. Which which one are the more, most important to you? That's a good question. Um, the <laughs> I kind of have this identity crisis about the art world, where I want to be invited into it so I can politely turn it down. <laughs> 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 like I want I want to be wanted by the art world, but at the same time I want nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I often find this you know when I watch my friends get you know like crazy art shows or get gallery representation, I'm just like, like I hate that, but also I'm jealous. <laughs> um, so I, I think I care most about the people who don't go to museums, who, um, one of my freelance jobs when I lived in New York was working with this company called Micro that makes these uh, vending machine sized science museums that would be temporarily deployed to, um, to like not rich neighborhoods because like New York City has like 500 museums and I think 400 of them are within like a mile of Central Park, you know, like where houses are $10 million. And like, it's disgusting. Like the, 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 the concentration of knowledge and knowledge building institutions is like predominantly rich and predominantly white. And one of their mission statements is to, put, is to put them in places where people are anyway, because a lot of people don't have the resources or the inclination to intentionally go to a science museum. So they put in the DMV, or they put it in like you know uh, a lobby of a large like housing development. Then you have people incidentally encountering STEM content who otherwise wouldn't get it. And I think things like that are really important. And I care a lot more about people who don't go to museums than, than people who do, because the people who go to museums are already have their needs very well met. By that you mean then the one that you've done in the public space is the most important to you? It is. Uh, I don't think it was a success on any level but it was, it was the most important, I think. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, that, that's that it kind of hurt to mm. see that. Do you want to take another go at it? It's, it's hard. Um, it's really hard to get civic grants unless you're in that art world. Yeah. Um, San Francisco actually has a program where you have to like, be pre-certified as like a legitimate artist, wow. which is you know, very counterintuitive. <laughs> <laughs> Um, they're very competitive, and a lot of people putting in the bids are, uh, you know, like artists who employ dozens of people, and the, peop the committees are often made up of uh, land developments and architects who, like, if they want to build 15 stories above the code, the city is like, okay, you can build higher, but you need to put three pieces of art downtown. So their goal is to make something that is utterly unpolitical. Um, difficult to object to on aesthetic grounds, and uh, zero maintenance. So you end up with like giant cherries, and just like, I don't know, what I think an art teacher might call meaningless formalist crap, or they something to call it plop art, because the only step of engagement is when the crane sets it down. Um, yeah, I'm a little jaded. I don't want to be. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot to learn, I think, when it comes to art. It's, it's usually just people's perspectives. Yeah. Most part. yeah. So, um, you have a word for your art, Mecha... Mechatronic. Yes. Could you talk more about that? Sure. Um, it's one of these things that gets into your head in college. Like, you take a class and you use the word, and you're like, that's not a word. And like, three months later, you're like, you don't know this word? Um, but I took a class uh, in college called Mechatronic Design, and it was about building robots. Uh, like the connection of electronic and mechanical things. Um, yeah, it's kind of the easeful work, but also it's just 
it's the same as saying mechanical electronic and it's not that much time savings. Maybe I should switch. <laughs> <laughs> but you're like merging the fine line between fine art and technology and I think it's really nice. Thank you. Um, I also think like the social impact or the way that you want to engage people socially in the work is really nice. Um, you didn't talk a lot here, but I also like, besides all of the piece with the glass, um, there's just the bubble one that you did at Carnegie Mellon. Yeah. I, I like that because you, um, do you have photos of it? Yeah. Yeah, because I think that like you, you kind of just like, it's like, like, you know how when you're a kid and you just want to build like a tent in the living room, just like cozy up with friends? It's like that, but like large scale and like a lot of like people together. Does somebody know the hotkey to get your cursor into the thing? Uh, esc uh, uh, if you go uh, escape. If you press escape, then you should get out of the of view and um, out of um, um, escape um, full sc full screen right now. Here we go. There we go. Oh wow! So uh, my documentation for this was lost. Uh, in a irresponsible use of hard drives. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like this one's mostly all white men. <laughs> uh, but my friend Max and I, uh, plastic sheeting, uh, you can weld to itself with an iron, which is like a regular clothes iron. And you can make incredibly large, elaborate things for like, this I think was like 40 US dollars worth of plastic. And it's uh, like 10 and a half meters by 10 and a half meters by 10 and a half meters. Um, and it's an inflatable space. Uh, and the first time we deployed it, uh, this was like the great hall uh, of our art school uh, during finals week. Um, and uh, we, we had permission to put it up, but I don't think anybody knew what they were actually saying yes to. <laughs> uh, there were a lot of fire code violations. I don't think it was actually dangerous, but essentially what happened was people who were cramming for finals, people who were working way too hard, in order to enter the building where the computer labs were, uh, opened the door and was greeted <laughs> with this inc an infinite white wall uh, that had giggling and uh, Brian Eno you know, music coming up from the inside. And Brian Eno you know, is like very ambient, like, <laughs> like the tracks are often like 50 minutes long. Uh, and the only way in uh, was to lift the bottom and go inside. And once they went inside, they were greeted with um, this is again the only photo uh, a bunch of foam, foam scraps from a carpet dumpster, like a carpet place dumpster, and just a bunch of people who weren't studying. <laughs> There's like 50 other people who also came to the building with the intention of studying and weren't. Is this paradise? <laughs> yeah, and it's like way better. And I'm sure the test scores are actually better for having been like well rested and well balanced than they would had they like crammed the night before. Uh, but as an art student, I had the privilege of not having to care. Uh, <laughs> um, and then it, we uh, briefly took it outside a couple times for these drama performances. Uh, we collaborated with the drama school and did a lot of shadow play with like a single, I think we used a thousand watt bare halogen bulb in the center that lit up the whole thing and just uh, really, really crisp shadows on the outside uh, of, the, of the bubble. Um, that was frustrating. Uh, there was a lot of access confusion where like, you know, they only had a couple shows and it was mostly internal and it, it was a lot of people saw what was going on from the outside, but uh, there was a scarcity issue that made it complicated, but uh, the performances seemed good. Uh, I didn't have a ticket. Um, <laughs> the, yeah, this was, I think, the most successful project I've ever done in terms of like societal impact. Um, you know, there's, the school is like, colleges are in a constant state of mental health crisis. Um, there have been there had been a suicide a few weeks earlier than this uh, in our department, and um, and that just felt it felt important in a lot of time. It felt stuff. Yeah. Okay. And this one. Cool. Um, should we move on to the? Yeah. Sure. Oh yeah. We should talk about Rob's new project. At the moment, the degenerator. <laughs> well, I keep making the mistake of glancing at that light and now I can't see anything. <laughs> oh, come on. I think PowerPoint's got some upsides on the uh, Google slides. All right, the degenerator. Huh. See, on PowerPoint, it'll be part of the computer. It wouldn't be. Anyway, what you're looking at is a GIF of this. <laughs> so it's. Here it is, the real one. 
Um, so essentially, um, the, the generator is a kinetic light powered intervention on toilet signage. It is an electromechanical device relying on light power and a pendulum mechanism to perpetually animate between the classic figure in trousers and figure in dress toilet signage. I've been working on this project since 2013. Um, I, when I was a kid, I think actually way earlier than this I had this idea. Um, my parents had one of those corkscrews where when you push the head down, the arms go up. The other one where the head is the, the bottle opener and the, yeah. the rest of it's for opening wine. And it just was so clearly a person. And I remember playing with it and like grabbing it by the cork and being like, man, woman, man, woman. <laughs> my understanding of gender at the time was not terribly nuanced. Uh, <laughs> and uh, then in undergrad, I made a version. Um, <laughs> oh, this version was not that well informed, but essentially, it was there was a ba there was a restroom storage on our floor. There was no bathroom on the floor that I worked on. There was one women's room on the floor above it, and one men's room on the floor above it. So my idea was to make an indicator for the door where you could be like occupied or like so it have three four states: vacant. Um, there's someone inside who doesn't care who you are. And there's somebody inside who would prefer that you are a pants person, and there's somebody inside who would prefer that you were a dress person. And that was the first version. And th th they had a hand that could point to the four states, and would switch between the. It was it was a mechanical disaster. It was a conceptual disaster. Also, there's no way to get the school to go for it, so it would have been like a temporary thing at best. And I was overworked on too many projects, so it never went anywhere. Um, back to this. <laughs> um, I built these functional prototypes, and my goal is to get thousands of these things out over the world. Um, soon, probably in the next two or three months, I'm launching a crowdfunding campaign that's going to, uh, sort of like Tom's shoes, but instead of giving unwanted shoes and destabilizing local <laughs> craft economies, I'm going to be giving bathroom signs to people who ask for them. <laughs> uh, so kind of like a buy five, give five kind of situation where for every bathroom sign set, somebody who wants them buys, some are set aside to go to queer nonprofits, uh, activists, and potentially vandals um, to put in bathrooms all over the world. Uh, gender is a lot more complex than <laughs> this would imply. Uh, my point, um, you know, it's, it's, it's more complex than a simple spectrum between trousers and dresses. Uh, it's ever-shifting, multi-dimensional, Subjective, cultural, and above all, it, it's personal. Um, the de the degenerator does not pretend to depict or summarize the multitudes of gender expressions in the world. The main goal of it, conceptually, is just to uh, point out the absurdity of the gendered signs we use now, that we chose uh, is that apparently in the 60s? It's hard to find history of the symbol mm -hmm. that, you know, the rounded foot, rounded hand person in pants would mean this is a place to get rid of your excrement if you are a person who sometimes does so standing, and <laughs> this is a place to do it if you generally don't. Um, yeah, the project was designed primarily to be deployed in the US, or as you may have heard, um, toilet decisions have become quite politicized. Uh, I think 35 states have passed bathroom-related legislation regarding trans issues in the past few years. Several uh, on the right side and several on the wrong side of the debate. Um, the, uh, yeah, and I think the time for making ungendered bathrooms available everywhere is, is upon us. Um, more than half of trans people have avoided using a public toilet uh, for fear of violence and harassment in the states, and the numbers for actual assaults are pretty similar to that, I believe. Um, it depends on uh, you know, direction of transition and uh, level of passing, but uh, the assaults are incredibly prevalent, and by enforcing these arcane and Victorian cultural assumptions on s in signage and in architecture, I think it really emboldens uh, trans folks to commit hateful acts of violence and aggression. I can confirm that 
Uh, I'm trained in holding my fire in. <laughs> but um, I'm just saying, like, a lot of the time, I think right now, uh, trans issues are like a really, really sensitive topic. Especially, there's a lot of attention focused on the U.S. that we actually look at here too. Mm -hmm. um, uh, honestly, um, I feel like I don't know. Have you guys ever been in any like danger or harassment in the bathrooms? Personally, never. Yeah, I I feel like if there's somebody who wants to have, to have Ill, if if there's a person who has ill intent towards another person, they will do. The bad thing that they're gonna do, regardless of the sign, bathroom sign on the door. So, trans people, we kind of just want to do our business and then leave. So we're not exactly like we're just trying to like have gender affirmation kind of thing. Now. Yeah, it's I this commonly this dialogue where um, often like trans activists are like you know pitted against uh, you know. What, what are sometimes called, you know, like uh, trans exclusionary radical feminists or, or TERFs, where the, you know, the, the TERFs will say things like, oh, like, you know, this is gonna endanger cis women. Uh, they would never say cis women, but <laughs> would endanger cis women by putting, you know, biological males in our, our toilets, which would like, it's, the, there's this absurd implication that, um, that like rape and sexual assault are crimes of convenience uh, when if, if a perpetrator of any gender presentation wanted to prey upon uh, cis women, the current, you know, gendered bathroom would be, a, women's room would be a perfect place for that. And you, you don't see that happening. You know, you don't see, you don't see people camping, you don't see predators camping out in bathrooms. The sexual violence issue is serious and severe, but it's not caused by architecture. It, it's caused by, by culture and it's, it's caused by a lot of things, but to imply that degenerating bathrooms puts anyone at additional risk when in fact it clearly has the effect of saving lives, um, with I think 45% of uh, trans and non-conforming people having attempted suicide at some point in their life, and I believe calls to one of the lifelines in the states uh, doubled in the, like six weeks after uh, North Carolina's uh, bathroom bill, the first, the first bathroom bill. Um, yeah, people are dying. <laughs> and sometimes uh, I think trans men are left out of the debate because um, sometimes when we start passing and like for me, I'm I can't change my gender marker unless I get full SRS, full sexual sex reassignment surgery here in Hong Kong. Uh, I have to like basically if I go into a male's bathroom, it's technically illegal for me. But the more I take my hormones when I get my surgery done, I will start to pass. And so if I continue to, you know, use a female's bathroom, people will, I think I'll freak people out. <laughs> I don't know, I think, honestly, all gendered bathrooms are like the most economical, <laughs> like for businesses really, like you have one bathroom for everybody. Um, the third section of the talk is uh, exploration of architectural options and that kind of oh, thing. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Transition. Yeah. The, uh, the, the, yeah, I was reading some businesses uh, <laughs> who, pun intended loopholes, are suddenly able to reclaim ten square meters <laughs> of their business um, by degenerating the bathroom and just having one. I had to convert to work Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> I can't do key boots in my head. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, each degenerator is going to come with one of these. This is undersized. Uh, it's going to be a little bit bigger. Um, this is an American style of uh, fully compliant uh, you know, Americans with Disabilities Act bathroom sign uh, that has the raised lettering because I believe 8% of blind people can read Blair Braille in the United States. Just very surprising and why raised lettering is so important because <laughs> it's a lot easier to learn. Um, each generator comes with one of these for free. Um, it turns out it doesn't actually add any cost to my manufacturing because it's the same plastic as this and every Chinese factory I spoke to just charges you a flat fee for any mold. Doesn't matter how complicated it is, doesn't matter what the finish is. Um, in the States, like going from a matte mold to a finished mold can triple the cost of to a, to a Chinese mold can triple the cost of your part, but um, 
pricing structures here work out in a way that this is this is a free, a free thing. So it, both things are going to come with um, permanent adhesive on the back. So you just peel off the paper and pass this around. Um, it looks like plastic, but it will snap if you break it. So if you bend it, obviously everything snaps if you break it. Um, this is a an army. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I proposed this to a gallery and. As like the art half, like I'm gonna have a bunch of these things, and I might as well like do an installation, and like how easy, just like the room can't be dark, it needs a wall. <laughs> um, this is also the first thing I've ever made in After Effects, so I feel pretty good about that. Um, how many people are interested in like electronics and how this thing works? Okay. Um, So essentially, um, it has three parts. There's a chip, a, <laughs> a three cent chip um, in the base that, is, that uh, gives occasional, and a coil, an electromagnetic coil, and a magnet. And the magnet's on these two pendulums that are connected together mechanically. Um, I'm going to play this again and then narrate it, but it's easier to point to this. So. Um, Electromagnet can become a magnet with electricity, and uh, you know magnets can either repel or attract attract each other. And this is set up to repel uh, very occasionally. When it's at rest, like when nothing's happening, every five seconds or so, it just gives it a tiny little push, pushes the magnet away, and then it gets swinging. It can just do that until the swings get big enough for the magnet to cross the coil. And once the magnet crosses the coil, uh, you can use electricity. Uh, to move magnets, or you can use magnets to move electricity. It's one of these things that kind of works both ways in a really beautiful and interesting way. And in this case, once the magnet crosses the coil, this three cent chip is able to detect that and start giving it pulses that are perfectly timed with the swinging of the arm. So uh, once it starts moving, it then gets to be really, really careful with the small amount of power it has um, because solar panels are very ineffective, especially indoors. Um, so it doesn't have that much power. So then it's able to give it perfectly timed pulses, like pushing your friend on the swing. You don't need to, like if your friend weighs, you know, like 40 kilos, you only need to push like, you know, 500 grams in order to get them going. Because you, you know, there's a, a tendency for pendulums to keep swinging. All you need to do is overcome wind resistance and the friction in the chain. And uh, anything else you give them, anything else you push your friend, is it going to be further than they swing. Um, so pendulums are a really good way to make movement without using a lot of power. Um, so I can pass this around. Uh, so this is the, a 3D printer printing the, it's black and white, so it's hard to tell. Here's me assembling it, I'm putting the coil in, I'm gonna put a solar panel in, and there it goes. Uh, this is an oscilloscope, which reads like voltage over time, so this is a graph, and these are the spikes of current or that, uh, that are perfectly timed with the pendulum. Um, so you can, I mean, I can't tell because I'm not that good at like music, but you could, one could tell <laughs> that the spikes are perfectly timed with the speed of the, I checked it in the video at some point because I don't have the, I don't have the gear for it. Um, yeah, and it, the, these components, because of economies of scale and the fact that these flip flop toys have been on the market uh, for one year longer than I've been alive, uh, mean that it just cra it's just, the economics are amazing. Uh, it's three cents for the coil, three cents for the chip. Uh, the price of the capacitor, which is like a battery, it stores the power so it can be used, um, you know, to make the pulse. Um, varies depending on markets. This is interesting. Um, every solar toy, and this one included, has to utilize incredibly low friction systems. Uh, like the axle for the arm can't actually spin in a hole because that's too much friction. So it has to rack back and forth. Um, in, on this little tiny, on this little tiny track, in order to work, um, I didn't clean the whole out with 3D print, but you get the idea. Um, it's a little messy in there. Um, so it's a one millimeter pin for scale. Um, the yeah, uh, I'm working on. I've now finally spoken to uh, Solitroy engineers who've given me, told me everything that's wrong with my design and why my design needs a painfully bright light to work. Instead of, uh, I'm trying to get it to work at, at like in, oh, I have slides for this. So, Doc, 
Um, I was wondering about your process. Did you look for specific electronics that were matching your spec, or did you just hack? Did you hack a uh, you know like the Hello Cat? That's a great question. So. Um, <laughs> Don't drop it. <laughs> I uh, I spent a lot of time learning Eagle, which is uh, the software a software used to design circuit boards. Reading patents on these circuits, trying to learn analog electronics, trying to figure out exactly like I found an electrical engineer who, uh, frankly, was old enough to know about like like, how, like details about analog electronics because they don't really teach it anymore. Yeah. Um, you know, I designed a chip. I did all this stuff, and no matter what I did, it never worked as well as those Raven Cat toys and the three cent board. And I didn't think of this until way later, but for these two ones, I just smashed toys. They were three dollars. I just smashed the toys, took out the bits, put it together. I'm like, hey, it's working. Uh, it's good to understand things. Yeah. Uh, but there was a version of this I tried to make. I was, originally, I was going to make a, a version that was actually made of circuit boards. Hmm. Um, because circuit boards are cheap at any quantity. Um, but there's aesthetic problems. Um, those are the only ones we can. Around. There's plenty of problems with that. Uh, there are uh, okay. assemblies, a lot of assembly work, and plastic is just the way things are made, and it makes it a lot cheaper. Um, oh, I said this all out loud. That's a lot more pink than what I said out loud. Yeah, so right now I'm kind of in like business mode, which isn't something I'm good at. It's never been my job. <laughs> Okay. My fixed costs are about five thousand US um, to open the mold, to have the mold cut and you know polished, uh, and then they're about three dollars each, fully assembled, fully packed, and with the double-sided tape, with the sign, with the painted letters, or with the logo, with the compliance, with the manual, with S signature. Sorry. Are you gonna sign it like an artwork? No. <laughs> Good question. Okay. Um, make a giant one and oh. then like attract investors. I might make a giant one at some point. Um, the uh, a giant one would be a lot slower uh, because mm -hmm. pendulum speed is related to several things. But I used to think it was related only to its length, and that's what they tell you in a physics class, and it's not true. It's only true for pendulums on strings. Um, but real pendulums are like metronomes, where uh, the since the string is rigid and there's often stuff above the axle point, the point where it rocks, you can change the speed by putting weight above that point. Like on a metronome, you slide up the little weight and you can make it slower. Yeah. Unfortunately, there's nothing above the shoulder, so my only option would be to put like some piece of metal right here to make it slow. But I think the speed is important because if it's too slow, people in passing glance would just be like, oh, immense. <laughs> and then you're like, I thought, but I thought. <laughs> I don't want everybody to gaslight people and you think either they're hallucinating. Uh, that's not nice. It's well, funny. But your animations show it's slower than it's operating. They yeah. do. Um, that, uh, that is a mistake. <laughs> uh, that animation was made before the prototype. And, yeah. Uh, I had to make that animation by typing values into a spreadsheet one by one because my CAD software doesn't do animation. Um, so I'm hoping to sell them for 30 US for a 3 pack <laughs> and that also goes one to someone else. Uh, we'll give three to other people. Um, and those are sh with shipping in domestically in the States. Uh, I haven't figured out international yet. Uh, they call it fulfillment in the in e-commerce e business, which is a really, it's a stretch of a word because a lot of people aren't fulfilled by the things they buy online. <laughs> right? That's what it's called when an order is fulfilled. I guess that's what the order wants to be in the world, is to be delivered. Um, yeah, I think it could work. So I'd have to, I'd, I'd have to take, I think I'd have to find about 500 backers at the $30 level. No, 1,000 backers at the $30 level to make, to make it work. I have some graphs, I'm gonna crunch some numbers. Would you buy three for 30 US? Yeah. I think it's affordable. Would you be upset at having two extra if you only wanted one? I want like a million. <laughs> <laughs> I've got your contact for it. So you, uh, when you said that you get, um, like Tom shows, like somebody else gets the same amount as you do, means that you receive all of them and then you have to dispatch them or you decide who are the other people? No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna afford them and send them out. Um, okay. Because I think the people, a lot of the people, the other people are going to be getting hundreds, so it'd be better if they came in one box. Yeah. Um, 
I had a question about how. So, imagine if these toilet signs, these signs were on the on the toilet. Would how would that make you feel? Would that make you feel safer? Would that make you feel amused personally? That's a good question. Wow, that's a thing I probably should have asked a lot earlier. Um, I think that I was very excited to find out that the uh, the clear text Braille sign was free because before like it was the the finances weren't working out and I was just like oh what if I ship these things without a sign it's going to be confusing like it's going to not match the existing sign like it's going to lead to all kinds of problems what if it breaks what if it, what if somebody smashes it and it's just a body with no arms um, but I'm really happy that the all gender restroom part uh, can be part of it because I think that it kind of supersedes the funny mechanical part huh. And I uh, also I'm not advocating putting these on multi-user bathrooms. I'm I'm advocating in general making multi-user bathrooms gender neutral um, as soon as possible by any means necessary. But I think simply swapping the sign uh, isn't going to be enough. <laughs> and I'm going to get into that in the next in the next section. Does that answer your question? Yeah. A quick thing about light levels. Oh. There's a picture of a small light and then a bigger light. Um, Lux is the unit for, there's lots of units for light, but Lux is the one about how much light is falling on a spot, like how bright a room is. Um, I've been carrying this around. They also make apps that are about as good. Oh, perfect. This is a 50 Lux room. This is my target dimness that, uh, for the operation of the toy, yeah. which I've been told by two out of five factories is possible um, by using an expensive which is 15 cents, but to them they're like, well, that's not three cents. Uh, <laughs> but uh, expensive, solo, larger solar panel. Um, I mean, when you're making millions of these things and selling them for a few dollars, that's, it's important to cut the cents, but you know, if I'm making this money. Uh, unfortunately, I found out the other day that a bar is like five. So now I'm looking into options for putting AA batter or AAA batteries in the legs. Um, so people can, if they have a very dim space, uh, still make use of the toy or the thing. I'm used to calling it a toy because it makes it easy to talk to factories. It's like, it's not a sign. It's clearly a solo toy. I'm like, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this project by the Genderettes, uh, specifically my acquaintance uh, Scout Tran out of San Francisco, uh, put non-removable, like it, it was a Kickstarter funding to distribute these stickers that could be removed that were, was very clearly the best toilet, uh, the best symbol for any all gender restroom, which is a picture of a toilet. You don't have to fuss around about like making an ambiguous looking silhouette. Uh, straight to the point. Uh, very successful project, uh, raised $8,000, um, shot a lot of dialogue, and uh, like, you know, I'm very happy to see people coming before me and doing almost exactly the same thing, but theirs doesn't move, and that's, that's cool too. <laughs> um, this is an interesting uh, project. I mean, it's an amazing project. Sarah Hendren just redesigned the American uh, person in wheelchair symbol to be uh, more dynamic and like a little bit less, um, I don't know, hospitalized looking. And started a vandalism campaign. And then in 2012, uh, New York State adopted that as the official symbol and has already changed like probably millions of dollars worth of, worth of signs uh, to reflect the new symbol. Um, it's just like, projects like this can be really successful. Uh, and I want to talk about toilets and what it actually takes to make a non-gender bathroom, at least in like you know, North American context where I know a lot about bathrooms. <laughs> Um, so these symbols were, became, uh, they became international standards in the mid-70s and national standards later. Uh, the American Institute of Graphic Artists was commissioned by the International Consortium of Airports and the International Standards Association to standardize icons because standards people were annoyed that like, you know, the German customs agent was different from the French one. So they made, I think, a hundred of these icons 
Uh, some of them are really funny and don't get used, like the drinking fountain is just like it looks like a person blowing bubbles. <laughs> um, but I think this is I think people have been using silhouettes with dresses or skirts, who knows? And trousers or naked, who knows? Um, <laughs> yeah. We also have seen the one where this is a cape. Oh, yeah, that's, that's good. Um, for a long time before that, but this the official ones came about in the seventies. Um, I think even by the standards of the seventies, the idea that a person in pants is a man it was absurd, and uh, the yeah, it's interesting. Some nations change the dress length uh, to match cultural expectations. The California two years ago uh, passed a law saying this is definitely in the right direction. Any single user bathroom has to be all gender. So if you can lock the door, and if um, it's actually resulted in some funny, funny things. I was in a gas station that had the same square footage for two toilets originally. They had a women's room with two stalls and a men's room with a toilet and a urinal with no partition. And because uh, the women's room was a multi-user bathroom and the men's room was a one-user bathroom, that, that gas station now has a women's bathroom and an all-gender bathroom. And when you go into the all-gender bathroom, there's a urinal. You're like, what? <laughs> 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 but it's, there's no, I mean, like, it's still one user, it's fine. And there's no reason why all gender bathrooms can't have murals. So and nice. We'll I talk about I that. One day we can get this in Hong Kong. It's, it's, like it's amazing. Also, it means I can go door to door in, in the city and be like, you are out of compliance. <laughs> you can be fined. You need to buy one of these right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's true. The fines are minor. And the, um, yeah, so I'm going to go through all these things. These are the five things that I know of that are gendered about restrooms, at least in the United States. Uh, the supplying or the not supplying of mental supplies, the existence or non-existence of small trash cans in the stall to dispose of things that can't be flushed, um, you know, like menstrual, menstrual products and, I don't know, like insulin needles and used catheters and, I don't know, all kinds of things that shouldn't be flushed. Um, that Right now, people in men's bathrooms are forced to either flush or like kind of hide toward the trash can, which will be visible on top of paper towels. Um, big mess. Uh, changing tables. This is insane, like in just like a regular sexism stuff. In California, until 2017, it was perfectly legal to have changing tables for babies only in women's rooms. Because, you know, it's decidedly unmanly to take care of a child. <laughs> Uh, urinals, uh, specifically urinals designed for males. There are female urinals, uh, and oh, I have a picture of one of them. Vending machines and what they sell is kind of similar to menstrual supplies, but you know I've seen truck shops that sell all kinds of like men marketed weirdness in the vending machines, the bathroom, like you know uh, condoms, sex toys, uh, supplements for virility. Um, yeah, the last thing is like weird art and sexist ads and signage. Uh, I guess graffiti, but that's not art. That's not art. <laughs> First thing, urinals are really complicated. They really, I feel like, throw a wrench into the whole bathroom degenerating uh, process. Uh, in Germany, this amazing thing happened like 15 years ago, where uh, Germany, seemingly all together at once, decided that uh, toilets, this kind of toilet, uh, there's really no reason anyone should be standing. It's it's bad for you. It's bad. For, you know, you're, 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 it's good to relax. It doesn't save any time. Uh, there's arguments to be made that if your shirt is tucked in, it might save time, but that's not the time to make the argument. Men generally aren't the people cleaning toilets, and since men aren't generally the people cleaning toilets, they're not aware of exactly how little of this urine gets into the toilet. Um, the, there's splash issues, there's relaxation issues, there's... Um, and it's, it's also just, if it's not faster, it, why other than like performative masculinity are we standing? Um, so, well, most German men. Well, it is faster though, isn't it? The cues for her in style is always huge compared to men's because it's just, you treat it like a towel, you don't have to stand it. I, I agree that the cues are generally faster. longer, but I don't, I, I'm not sure it's because of urination speeds. Yeah, I don't know, it's because the, the space required for women's titles, they're all beautiful. But yeah. in the space of two women's toilets, you can fit five So this men. is an attack on urinals. Germany didn't get rid of urinals. They just stopped yeah. standing at this kind of toilet. So at a urinal, I agree. It's, it's faster, it uses less space. Yeah. But 
it doesn't save any time if you already have if you already if there's already not a urinal if you're already using a regular toilet. Oh, uh, I see. Then. Why are we standing? Yeah, it's yeah. a really hard question, um, and it's it's one that Germany really struggled with. It actually <laughs> went to one of the Supreme Courts in Germany. Uh, landlords uh, failed to return I believe twelve hundred euros. It might have been a long time ago. Maybe it was marks. Who knows? Bunch of money, like a crazy amount of money, was de deducted from a tenant's deposit because the tenant was a, a stehen uh one who stands one, one piece. Uh, and the landlord, thinking this is abhorrent, unacceptable behavior, uh, withdrew the amount of money it would take to retile the bathroom because uh, I think it had unsealed stone floors, urine's really caustic, and it had a serious and detrimental effect to the floors in the amount of a thousand euros. Took it to the Supreme Court. Turns out, apparently in Germany, uh, men have a fundamental right to stand, which was like a drawback for the, the sits pink building community, the people who sit. Um, but it was like a, it was a real like uh, galvanizing force for the debate, and I think it ended up with more people sitting because it opened up people realizing that like, oh my god, I did $1,000 worth of damage to my floor <laughs> just by standing up. It didn't save time, what was I thinking? Um, the, uh, well, the court really found that the, it was the landlord's job to warn the tenant. So it wasn't, but there was also the, it was, it was complicated. I know my German's not great. But um, I think it's an interesting thing to start with when talking about urinals, uh, because of what urinals are and what they're not. Um, most gender neutral bathroom proposals uh, just get rid of them, which I think uh, is a good solution, but also a complicated solution. Here are three kinds of urinals. Um, uh, this is a urinal designed for, oh, I don't understand nails. <laughs> uh, the, I imagine that nails. This is a urinal designed for uh, females, this is one designed for anybody, and this is one designed for males. Um, these two are obviously incredibly uncommon, and, uh, but if you're looking for safe space savings in a urination specific toilet, uh, and are willing to do away with the privacy <laughs> issue, which is the big problem with urinals. These things exist. Um, and I think it's interesting to bring up. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, this is the thing. Th this is a very common sign in, in Germany. Um, but yeah, this was legible on my screen. Anyway, it's, men cannot be compelled to these things down. And I think this is going to be the problem. One of the problems with, with bathrooms degendering is that. Even if they could legally be compelled to be sitting down, like there's just no way it's going to happen overnight culturally. And then there's a sanitation issue, which is um, if you have sitters and standers sharing the same typical toilet, there's a lot of splash. I mean, I've heard there's a lot of splash also in you know bathrooms designated for women because of you know hovering and that kind of thing. But that's <laughs> it's not my place to to know or discuss. Uh, I think this is an unique solution, which is common in Western porta potties, uh, which is that within the same stall, there is just like, a, oh, you're standing up? Wouldn't you rather stand up into something that isn't, you know, 50 centimeters away? <laughs> um, well, you just turn to the left, and then there's a, a urinal ready for use. Um, privacy issues. I think that really the, the thing about the urinal that's, I think it kind of just, it, it, uh, exist because they've always existed, but I think if we were designing bathrooms from scratch, there's no way we'd come up with it. It's like, okay, so everybody gets privacy, unless you're a person who uses men's room and who stands. Then, like, you know, all bets are off. At best, you get a divider that actually does nothing. You know, it's, they, they almost never provide any actual privacy, and I don't know, I think the social boundaries are neural use very drastically from person to person, as like whether or not conversation's okay, or like, eye contact or phone use or like all this weird cultural stuff. And I think that if urinals are kept, they should almost certainly be put into stalls and be given the same amount of privacy afforded to every other toilet user. Um, but in the States, even stalls have laughable privacy. It's about 30 centimeters ground uh, to the bottom of the stall. This stops at two feet and the gaps at the hinge and at the latch <laughs> or often this or worse. Wait, really? Swear to God. <laughs> um, it's better in Hong Kong. Than <laughs> partitions are expensive, yeah. which, given that we're talking about architecture, is an insane thing to say. But since people see these as objects instead of part of the building, they're just like, why would I spend this much on a partition? Uh, and this interesting thing about the standing peeing, uh, the ones that are made of powder coated steel, 
if they're within any distance of the urinal, you can see a like a rainbow of rust where the urine splash has eaten through the paint and rust. And this is like any, if it's like if it's powder coated steel and it's less than five years old, like it's it's crazy. Like the the like I think we need to be <laughs> more conscientious about architectural and design solutions for containing urine. Um, but yeah, it's supposedly like it reduces sex work in bathrooms and it improves violence. Like it makes it easier to to clean. It saves material. Um, it's easy to tell if it's occupied. It's like oh, they have indicators for that. You don't need to see somebody using the bathroom. But like it's, it's totally normal behavior in the states to just kind of just like move sideways across one of these, and then you get a split scan, and essentially like the way a scanner reads a paper, you've seen the inside of the skull, and you're like oh, it's empty. What have I done? But like the architecture in, in bathrooms in the States is horrible. Um, this is the dream. You know, wow, those doors start at the floor and go to the ceiling like a door. The walls start at the ground and go to the ceiling like a wall. <laughs> oh my god, is this an indicator that tells you whether it's occupied or not? <laughs> what mechanical geniuses are these? Um, it's not, it's not a complicated thing. And I don't think it's, it's terribly more expensive than replacing your rusty, weird dividers. Um, oh, and the biggest provider of American stall providers is a company called Heine Hiders, which is a euphemism for butt and then one who hides. Um, I think it's a British euphemism. I've only ever heard it in Austin Powers. <laughs> um, mental supplies are another huge difference between bathrooms. Uh, I don't know who it was, but there's an anonymous campaign at my college to add sanitary bins to all the stalls. They just bought them, you know, they were like $40 each, and they just put them up. And because they're in, the janitorial staff changed out the bags, you know, because, you know, they, they knew where to get the bags. They were the same models in the other bathrooms because, you know, there are men who menstruate, and there are men with insulin needles, and men with catheters, and men with, like, Kodowski bags, and all kinds of things that aren't our business to speculate about, who need access to trash cans in the bathroom or else you're putting them in a position where they have to choose between their privacy and your plumbing. And they're probably going to choose their privacy. Um, yeah, these little bins, um, those ones too. I know very little about them. So the ideal bathroom is metro bin, toilet, and urinal on the side. I think so. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think, oh, uh, changing table. And changing table somewhere. Somewhere. <laughs> um, the vending machines, uh, hopefully free dispensers. Um, the, this is interesting, I found this was uh, available to, in the center of a bathroom, I found on Flickr, where it's a toothbrush, uh, pads, tampons, condoms, and then a sex toy. Um, where, where, where is that? Vending machine. I think it's uh, probably in France, if I have a <laughs> Oh no, it's in English. I don't know. I think we have them in the UK, where, yeah, in Maybe not sex toys. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a lot of sex toys in Berlin, but they would have been German. I mean, <laughs> true fact, but like, you know, I saw a bunch of uh, bathroom dispensers. Hmm. Um, weird sexes are choices. Uh, choices, choices, everybody, with, with an S, sorry. Uh, this is probably a bigger problem than men's rooms, but this isn't rare. It's like super heteronormative, incredibly sexist. Uh, I doubt that the models posing for these stock photos, knew that they'd be used in this way. Um, it's just like, uh, oh, that's a video. And like, I've seen worse, like you can get urinals uh, shaped like painted lips. You can get, you, there's all kinds of weird, oh, like pinups, pen like actual porn, plastering the bathroom, sexist conics, like all this really weird stuff. And it's like, no, you don't understand, this is a place where you go to get rid of excrement. This isn't like an art show for your weird ideas about society. <laughs> This is a place that's actually necessary for everybody to use as many as like 10 times a day if you know, you're overhydrated. Um, this organization of academics and architects and designers and more uh, took it upon themselves to design the perfect bathroom. Um, so they start with their regular bathroom contrast. So they, I'm just going to, oh, you can, you can, you can see it. So they, 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 no, I'm going to show you on my screen. 
Oh, wow. I would like to see where I am in the video, please. Thank you, Google. <laughs> okay, Google. Give me an interface. Any interface at all. Back a slide, forward a slide. There we go. Too far. Single open space, replacing the typical stalls which reveal the gaps. Compromise privacy with fluorescent partitions and different areas for washing and grooming. We have developed a process for retrofitting sex segregated restrooms that takes the multi user of the step further. First, we work with the plumbing step wall to the bathroom as an open space. We then work with the corridor wall, treating the bathroom as a porous extension of the hallway. We have three different types of fully enclosed stalls standard, ambulatory, and EA, as well as caregiving which include six changing tables. We have committed grooming and washing stations off the circulation path, and finally a lounge that transforms the corridor into an animated social space. This solution has three advantages. Restroom users can visually monitor one another, reducing the risk of violence. Gender non-conforming people are stuck between two options that don't align with their identities. And it meets the needs of the trans community, as well as a wide range of different people people, including caregivers, the elderly, mothers, Muslims, and people with disabilities. Stoll has also developed a prototype for high traffic spaces like airports that reimagine the restroom as an open precinct animated by three activity zones, grooming, washing, and eliminating. We're promoting inclusive restrooms. I love the use of the word eliminating. They're like, I wonder what that is. Um, yeah, so it seems like by getting rid of the wall, you actually <laughs> you enhance privacy because you have you can have ventilation and, and floor ceiling doors, which offer they phrased it as visual, acoustic, and olfactory privacy. I was just like, wow, olfactory. <laughs> just like <laughs> smells can't get out of the stalls, everybody. <laughs> Plain English. Thank you. Um, the. They don't touch the. I, I read their entire website. They never mention urinals. Um, they just didn't want to use that word, or no, they don't. They just got rid of them, oh. um, which I think is a great a great solution. But I, I don't know how um, how quickly it could be implemented. Yeah, because I, mean, I I know it is practical for a lot of people to have those. <laughs> Yeah, so I think that their multi-user all gender bathrooms are complicated. And I think that just regendering one suddenly is a great way to start a dialogue. Um, but I think that for the sake of accessibility and inclusion and just not confusion, I think that um, it's not it's not a good stopgap. Um, something I've seen that seems to be a good stopgap until until architectural solutions can be implemented. And again, like I'm not trying to give people an excuse to delay architectural solu architectural solutions, but you know, like this, I think the stickers that say this restroom can be used by anyone, you know, regardless of gender identity or presentation, under the gendered bathroom sign and like directions to a ungendered space, seem to me at least to be a good thing to do in, until we can architecturally redesign the bathroom. But yeah, I don't know. The, it just seems that putting putting the sign on, on the bathroom as it is uh, doesn't solve any problems. Yeah. <laughs> but at the moment, it is um, there's a lot of political attention towards this. But we do need to like do more to actually implement these ideas, so then it can like move society forward a bit in terms of that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean. Like, we live in a society where there's a lot of, like, a lot of things are, like, really unequal, but I would like to think that all genders are equal and that everybody, female, male, non-binary, everybody, should be judged on the equal ground. I don't know why people are making a big fuss if we just wanted to switch because it felt better for us. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So... Yeah, that's everything I know about bathrooms. <laughs> very detailed. Yeah, the I'm sure it's different here. You know, the the 
definitely the architectural different. I, I love the tiny toilets and ti tiny sinks for kids. Oh, yeah. That's something I've never seen in the States. And it's just like, wow, that's, that's thoughtful. These people know that children exist. <laughs> I think that's coming from Japan. Is that right? Japan has got a tradition of having those toilets. Small. Yeah, with the kids. They also have like, those mechanical bath toilets, like where you uh, the like, Japanese toilets. Yeah, yeah, the, the bidets, yeah, the bidets. Double bidet. Yeah, yeah. right. Uh, but yeah, in terms of culturally, um, I think in Hong Kong it's still a very sensitive issue. People don't bring it up. It's really taboo. There's still a lot of negative stigma associated, not just being trans, just uh, just queer community in general. Um, is hard, but I think like we need to speak out in order to uh, have change in society, per se. So, um, and it's really nice seeing. I did not know bathrooms had like this huge. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. if someone just picked that, you know, that I I can't figure it out. One theory is it's exactly twelve inches, which is a foot, which is like our base unit. Mm -hmm. So I'm just like, did they just pick one? Is that where they got that? They're just like, one should be a good number. And like, no, it doesn't matter how big it is. It's one. <laughs> it's the only theory I can come up with, and also I think it makes mopping easier. But like, yeah, the people who are mopping aren't the people who are having bathrooms, and usually, people who are doing mopping aren't thought of at all by architects. Yeah. So that can't be it. Yeah. Usually the <laughs> stalls have a uh, little bit lower. Yeah. It's like you can tell if it's occupied. But none of those better ways. <laughs> yeah. So, are there any questions people have? Anybody want to know more or are curious? Oh, I had a thought. Yes. I was going to add a slide about uh, collateral benefits to degenerating bathrooms. Yes. Mm. Uh, one is uh, water savings, um, especially uh, in cultures where bathroom use is like less open. Um, flushing to cover sounds is not uncommon. Um, someone was telling me in Japan is uh, average like three flushes per per, per visit, so they've actually gone to the trouble of installing these little boxes that when you pick a sound, like ocean sounds or like. Or, you know, like a little jukebox that plays noises. Um, shorter wait times. In, uh, you know, in if it's very difficult for architects to predict, you know, their gender breakdown of spaces. Like often in colleges, there's this issue where it's just like, well, there weren't any women when we founded this building. And it's just like, it's not an excuse. <laughs> but you know, like if you had an all women's conference, there's like a, you know a huge line at the women's room, and then you know, no one in the men's room, and if you're at like a tech conference, which essentially is often ends up being an all-men conference,